Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming. Um, and welcome to the second of Wilson's 50th anniversary uh, lectures. Now, as most of you know, I think the idea behind these lectures was to ask people, Wilson people, to reflect uh, on what had happened in their field of interest over the half century that the college has been in existence. And um, I'm very pleased, very pleased indeed, to welcome tonight's lecturer. She's Pauline Terrorhorst, who was a Wilson Press Fellow way back in 2000. Pauline is a very distinguished Dutch journalist, who from 1985 to 2002 was the fashion editor of De Volkskrant, which is a major Dutch daily newspaper. She has also been director of the Amsterdam School of Fashion, which is part of the University of Amsterdam, and director of the Centraal Museum in Utrecht. She's now the director of NatLab, a theatre and art house in Eindhoven, which is based at the former physics laboratory of Philips. Her subject tonight is fashion and how it has evolved over the last 50 years. So if there's anybody in this audience who once wore flared trousers, <laughs> prepare to be embarrassed. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Pauline Terrorhorst. Thank you. It uh, really is a great honor to be here this afternoon to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Wilson. That someone like me, an amateur in the academic field, is invited at all here on this festive occasion to talk about fashion is due to one person, a lonely, energetic, tireless, wonderful, and always lovable Professor Norton. <laughs> Not that he can be accused of fashionable vices. <laughs> Not at all, I might say. And I know I will not offend him with this remark. He wouldn't want to be seen dead in an Armani. It is one token of his broad-mindedness to allow me here 15 years ago, together with a selection of colleagues from all over the world called Press Fellows. The presence of a bunch of strange people every season in these premises, which qualified each of us for the dignified title of Press Fellow of Wilson, is one of the many great achievements he accomplished. And I can assure you that it was not a small task to select them, tear them away from their time-consuming jobs and families, and get them from all over the world to this place. Get them funded by you and other big companies, and more important, get them at work. And with this I mean real work, starting every day at nine o'clock sharp behind a pastime desk in a monk-like cell, to work on a research job with a deadline of four to six months. I mean, we are talking about people who usually work with deadlines of four to six hours in messy cafes. As I myself often experienced while working in Paris for the Dutch daily, the Volksfront. Or on assignments like, Marlene Dietrich is dead. Could you please write a piece of 2,000 words for tomorrow morning's paper? Deadline 6 p.m. And this was a phone call at 2 p.m. We are talking about an era when a journalist was able to publish 2,000 words in a newspaper, got paid for it too, even for articles about a flimsy topic like fashion, and not have to condense your deepest thoughts in the 140 tokens of a tweet or the 200 words of a blog for free. More essentials of daily life have changed since the peaceful days I spent in Wilson during the turn of the century. And all of this can be linked to fashion, as you would imagine a former fashion journalist would do. First of all, let me fill you in about our topic this late afternoon in February. What is fashion? The clothes that we choose to protect and adorn us and that play a role in our daily communication with other human beings are all brought and often cherished by us, bought and often cherished by us, because they convey a certain quality or meaning. But what unites them always is that they belong to a certain moment in history. Just browse through your own closet on a lazy Sunday. You can always tell if this or that piece of clothing belongs to a certain moment of your life, sometimes long, long ago, if you bought quality. Have a look at what people were wearing here around the time Wilson started in the 60s. <laughs> Do you still, still wear trousers with flares, brown corduroy jackets, 
flower prints and self-knitted sweaters over here? I doubt it. And do women still wear trouser suits in bright colors, as we've seen before? Do you still have those long hairdos? Even the most unfashionable of you will have noticed that their ties are much smaller these days. Like the lapels of your jackets, and in general, the fabric is lighter, thinner, more flexible. Less visible, but equally important is that you can wear your clothes every season. Summer and winter clothes will have different colors, but the fabric will be the same. All this is due to cool wool, a very thin thread, and a mixture with lycra to make it flexible. Technical innovations have led to suits that are as comfortable as sportswear. The story of fashion didn't start in the 60s. It started at the beginning of the 19th century. To understand fully what happened in the 60s, I would like to give an overview of the most important changes. I will talk you through the last two centuries and will discuss more in depth what happened with trousers and suits when Yves Saint Laurent laid his elegant hands on it. I will expand on this a little and will conclude with latest trends in fashion and what we could learn from the general changes. The fashion of black and white. Fashion is a broad theme. Almost anything can be included. There are even fashion trends in academic research, as you will know. But you can always relate fashion trends to modernism, to the emergence of city life, the anonymity of crowds, and the desire to somehow stand out, to be able to contact others and to share common ideas, a common background. If this can be achieved without directly wearing a red or pink tie, the more the better. Some can make a statement by only wearing a black suit and a white shirt. It happened several times these last two centuries. What unites these, these trends is the desire to be part of the times, to reflect a sense of urgency in what you wear, to be up to date. Let's have a quick overview of what it means to be part of your times. In their time, these French noblemen were up, up to date, but definitely something happened when this fellow arrived on the scene, an early portrait of Voltaire. You even do not have to know what he did or wrote to see that he symbolized the break with the past. From this time on, a truly modern man, a gentleman, wore black and white, like the Dutch and English Calvinists were already doing for quite some time. At the turn of the century, almost everyone wore black and white suits. You could easily disguise as a gentleman with an outfit like this. Their suits look timeless until you compare it with the latest men's fashion shown last January in Paris, here, by Yves Saint Laurent. Black and white again, but what a difference. Let's start with the shoes. Fashion always starts with the shoes. You see, you see very narrow boots, followed by extremely skinny trouser legs, a tie half as wide most of you are wearing, and jackets that could only button up if you decide to lose half of your weight, <laughs> which actually designer Karl Lagerfeld did. He underwent a stomach operation to be able to wear these kind of skinny suits. Why did men start to wear black and white at the end of the 18th century? It was the uniform of the new bourgeois, of course. So far more convenient, simple and efficient as the lace and silk of their predecessors in power the noblemen. It also had to do with the image of modern times, of speed. All these men in black and white looked aerodynamic in a way, much more than their spouses. They looked like a train or a plane. They were ready for takeoff and were far more dynamic than anyone else. And what a splendid journey it was. This kind of communication through, through clothes is, I find, and I hope you will agree, one of the most interesting elements of fashion research. It shows that fashion can never be understood on its own. Of course, there is fashion history and economic research about the production and consumption of clothing, which differs from fashion. Then there are shelves full of theories about fashion and sex. And perhaps you will be disappointed, but I would rather leave that aside and concentrate on the fact that fashion communicates all kinds of messages, not only about availability. And all of these messages and the way they can be expressed in fashion have changed the last 50 years enormously. 
And that is fashion in the first place, a way of capturing the time and the change. Let's zoom in on these five decades, these Wolfson years, before I concentrate on one typical example. What changed fashion in all its aspects is youth culture. What youngsters were wearing in smoky cafes in the late 50s and early 60s. That had nothing to do with aerodynamics, as you see. With their monkey coats, long shawls, pullovers and baggy trousers or jeans, they rebelled against their black and white fathers. In the 60s, conservative, decent suits of respectable men were ridiculed by these kind of designs, colorless jackets, long hair. In retrospect, it looked quite decent though, but it caused a revolution, as you know. In the 70s, color was added, and flower prints, as we saw before in your photographs. Rediscovered ancient cultures provided new materials, like the Afghan coat here worn by a young David Bowie, on one of his wedding days. <laughs> Exotic cultures with their confusing and attractive fashion languages produced a gold mine of signs of tokens to alter the message one would like to convey, that of being different, members of a new world order. Here, punks in Amsterdam. And that created this size of change in the creation of fashion. When people are actively involved in creating messages, and are delighted to do so, and are able to do so, because they have essential knowledge about the history, like disco in London. You do not need couturiers anymore, who tell you to wear your hands shorter or longer, or your trousers wider, unless you were already doing that yourself and just needed some extra encouragement. That was the moment couturiers were replaced by designers by people who looked at other people before they went to their drawing boards or their sewing machines. Old names faded away and new ones entered the stage. I was there and saw a shy Galliano, then, an over-self-conscious Westwood, an introvert de Meulemeester, wizard like Gautier and a funny Paul Smith, presenting themselves for the first time. These people started immediately to design for shops, not for individual clients. They are household names by now. Here are some invitations for their shows. All went well until the moment these kind of clothes could be copied within weeks and then sold for a couple of pounds in stores like Hennes and Maurits. At that moment, the rich and famous needed new elements to distinguish themselves from the masses. Accessories became more important than clothes and more expensive. And then came 2008 and the credit crunch. It created an outburst of creativity for individuals for whom exclusive brands meant a diminishing of individual, clothes, individual choices. What do all these images tell us? What happened during these five decades? Women wearing trousers, we've seen that. Men dressing up. Unisex clothes. Casual chic. Sneaker culture. Mobility. And that we could condense to the story of Yves Saint Laurent, Saint Laurent and the trouser suit. Why did all this happen? The answer lies in the use of the suit worn by men and women. The moment women, moment women started to wear suits, the overall message of clothes changed. Fashion always relates to freedom, social status and gender. With the emergence of the trouser suit for women, those three elements lost their fixed connection to certain pieces of clothing. And this affected an industry that knows it has to adapt to the changing times. And here precisely do we see how fashion works. I would like to focus on a special occasion, 50 years ago, when Wolfson arrived on the scene. And I assure you the opening of this college had nothing to do with this defining fashion moment. Until the end of the 60s, French women working in companies were prohibited from wearing trousers. Girls were forbidden to wear trousers in schools, except on extremely cold days. 
answering a question addressed to the Conseil de Paris by a certain Dr. Bernard Lafay, who thought that these requirements were no longer necessary, the Bulletin Municipal Officiel stated on June 29, 1969, 69, that the Prefect of Police considered it wise not to change the laws due to any foreseeable and unforeseeable variation in fashion that could at any moment come into being. Although women had already started to wear trousers in leisure contexts in the early 20th century, on the beach, on the golf course, while skiing and playing other sports, and working women might wear trousers and overalls in industry for functional reasons, at the end of the 60s, tradition still determined, determined what was to be expected from a decent woman in public. A woman must not wear men's clothing nor a man wear women's clothing, for the Lord your God detests anyone who does this. The Bible. The examples of artists like Colette, suffragettes who had worn trouser suits as a sign of liberation, and Marlene Dietrich's famous outfits in the 30s had not received much of a following. No secretary or professional woman would dare to enter the office in trousers nor would any woman go to church in trousers, as we have seen so vividly and extravagantly displayed in the popular Mad Men series. This rapidly changed in the late 60s and early 70s. Previously distinguished, if not discriminated for their male colleagues and bosses by the obligation to wear a dress or skirt, secretaries and other professional women started to wear business suits too. The once scandalous apparel of Colette and Marlene Dietrich, which had raised questions about their sexual orientation, had become legitimate, fashionable clothing. Fifty years later, one can conclude that this revolution was set to last. The transformation of professional women, women's clothing in the early 70s may easily be mistaken for just another aspect of the broad cultural changes of that period like blurring or traditional, of traditional social and cultural distinctions, usually associated with the student revolt, the second wave of women's liberation, and the emergence of youth culture. However, the massive introduction of women's trouser suits to the business world did not start on the streets, although some daring individuals showing trousers in the public domain inspired it. Professional women did not assemble to demand suits nor did they spontaneously start to sew their own trousers or begin to frequent shops and tailors selling men's clothes. The outfits they started to wear were waiting for them, lined up on racks in department stores and respectable ladies' wear boutiques. The massive public emergence of trouser suits for women was the achievement of an industry. To produce the new trouser suits for women, the fashion industry had had to invest in in technical technologies and the skills of seamstress, seamstresses several months before the new outfits started to appear in the stores. Although the garments might have looked like men's clothes in form, in fact they differed in sizing, materials used and tailoring techniques. Someone, somewhere, had decided that it was time for upper and middle class women to start wearing trouser suits in the office and when going into town. The fashion industry had followed up to the point where department stores began to include the new look in their stores waiting for buyers. They soon showed up in great numbers. In fact, the time and location of the beginning of this revolution can be identified with precision. If one site has to be singled out as the place where the new possibilities for women's clothes were introduced, it is the catwalk of the February 67 show of Yves Saint Laurent's spring summer collection in Paris. And this is not a photograph of this moment because you, you were not allowed to photograph that. The parliament, parliament had effectively abandoned the law that the prefect of police in 69 still thought wise to maintain was located in a distinguished Paris hotel. Catwalks at the Paris fashion shows were at that time the most important sites for making fashion public. And although the presentation of new fashions has altered considerably 
since everyone with a smartphone can immediately show his or her favorite garments to the whole world, there are still strict regulations. Biannually, the Chambre Syndicale de la Haute Couture et du prêt à porter Française allows a select group of designers to show their work to an audience of a few dozen to a few hundred people. The audience consists of important store buyers for specialized shops, the main department stores and luxury goods retail chains all over the world. Important private buyers, stylists and other leading figures in the fashion world, as well as fashion journalists from newspapers, women's magazines and other media. Invitations are strictly personal. Tickets for the shows are not for sale. The audience is seated in a packing order. Today, a show will not start unless Anna Wintour, editor-in-chief of American Vogue, and Susie Mankus, former IHD, now blogger in Vogue, have arrived in their front row seats. Personalities from the film and music industry add luster to the event. The media will report who said where. Jay-Z, Jennifer Lopez. The environment is highly competitive. The rise and fall of designers and models are noted immediately in polls, accelerating the making and breaking of reputations, like the reputation of this girl. And this was the first time she was seen on a catwalk. This is Claudia Schiffer. Fashion shows are at the same time a market, a demonstration of new tastes, ideas, technologies and skills, and theatre. There is unity of place, time and action. The shows are meticulously, meticulously designed. Music and props are carefully selected to emphasize a theme, style or mood. The catwalk models have to stick to a rigidly controlled choreography. Only top models being allowed some individuality, like here Claudia Schiffer. The shows usually take place in the three halls in the basement of the Louvre, which have especially been designed for the Paris fashion events, but also in theatres, old factories and even university halls. The audience is usually in the dark while the performance bathes in light. The audience at the show is not a passive crowd, but an active part of the transformation of the newly presented designs into legitimate pieces of fashion. Since the early 50s, the fusion of a new look is mediated along two channels. Buyers from important stores and well-patronized shops will choose designs from the collections for their clientele. Formerly they paid for the patterns, now they order precise selections of the design. The media will present the new collection as news to a broader audience that may not immediately run to the shops to buy expensive designer clothes, but which is interested in becoming informed about what is en vogue. Journalists, photographers and cameramen invent phrases and images to catch the mood of the event, thus translating the new designs for readers of magazines and social media audiences. The times when fashion news from Paris dictated the length of skirts and dresses have gone, but currently, the new trends in fashion reported in magazines from Vogue to The Guardian still reflect what is shown in Paris. Fashion shows present the work of many months and they require substantial investment. Success in Paris still means becoming the talk of the town, a business achievement, gaining credit for styles that will be translated to the mass market and a place in fashion history. Failure to score on the catwalk, a less than enthusiastic reception, is a business disaster. If successful, a new style, a new design, new colours, new ways of tailoring, or even a new type of clothing is born, and the avant-garde will bear the new designs in the year to come. If successful, the designer will rise to stardom, although that effect happens not so often anymore, besides stardom as its backdrop, as John Galliano has experienced. Later, designs will be translated for the mass market. Nowadays, it takes only a few weeks to two decades ago, it took one or two years after a successful show when women all over the world concluded that their wardrobe had lost its former attractiveness, and that it was by now hopelessly out of date 
and urgently needed to be replaced. Nobody has explicitly instructed them to adapt their taste, but the new look has been around on social media, in magazines, on television, and in the shops in the top segments of the market. The rhythm of change in fashion provides the basis of a global multi-billion dollar industry. In 67, the context of presenting fashion was not as elaborate as it is today, but key elements were already present. <clears throat> Events took place in distinguished Paris hotels like the Intercontinental we see here. And like today, celebrities and film stars attended. Fashion news made headlines in every major newspaper in the world, in a commanding language analyzed by Roland Barthes in his Système de la Mode that stressed the sailor neckline of this summer or the Tsarina look of this winter. Diana Vreeland, who was then editor-in-chief of Vogue, lead, lead the pecking order of that day. For this audience, on an early February morning, there we come again, to the excitement of the catwalk audience, Yves Saint Laurent showed trousers suits for women. By the end of the 60s, Yves Saint Laurent was generally considered to be the world's most important contemporary fashion designer. After having been the top designer at Dior for several years, and a sad interlude in the army with the help of his companion Pierre Berger, Yves Saint Laurent had opened his own fashion house in 64. It was an instant success, and a declaration of war against old institutions and ideas. Saint Laurent didn't want to design for rich ladies only. He wanted his designs to be seen and worn by a new generation of daring women he met at the wild parties he attended in Paris. In 67, he opened a special Vrive Gauche store for them, which carried, and still carries, his cheaper ready-to-wear line, at that time an exception among couturiers. Saint Laurent's status was reflected by the women who wore his designs, film stars like Catherine Deneuve, and pop singers like Françoise Hardy, and models like Betty Catrou. All of them had reputations for independence and unconventionality. His longtime use, Catherine Deneuve, chose Saint Laurent to design the complete wardrobe for her leading role in Bunuel's Belle de Jour, as you see here. The infamous portrayal of the erotic pastime of a bourgeois lady. Singer Françoise Hardy, you see it there on the left, having hit the charge in 62 with Tous les garçons et les filles de mon âge, was on the front pages of her relationship with, among many others, Johnny Holiday, and for riding a motorbike completely clad in black leather, as you see here. Betty Catrou, known for her independent style of presenting herself and later portray portrayed by Helmut Newton in a picture that stressed her androgynous features, became a long-standing muse and soulmate for Saint Laurent. He once called her his twin sister. All of this was recently shown in two biographical films about Saint Laurent who were released last year. Yves Saint Laurent was too great for only one. Saint Laurent's road to men suits for women took three stages. In February 66, now almost 50 years ago, he introduced the dandy look. Saint Laurent presented the black velvet costume with white lace blouses with flounces. The costume had clearly been inspired by the look of late 18th century dandies immortalized by Beau Brumel. With this striking black and white costume, Brumel and his followers had started a reaction in the London salons against the colourful and ornamented silk costumes of the nobility. It went into the history of fashion as a sign of independence and uniqueness, of struggle out of group norms. Citing these predecessors, Saint Laurent clearly signalled he was looking out for a confrontation. In August 66, this smoking, a tuxedo for women, followed. The new outfit was received as an innovation but also met with uneasiness. Worn over a bare chest, the tuxedo alluded to the nightlife of bisexual and lesbian women. When Betty Catrou wore Saint Laurent's tuxedo in nightclubs like Régine and at the opera, the audience whistled. The revolution that was about to happen was, however, hardly noticed by fashion journalists. In the summer of 66, the media focused not on trousers, but on skirts. 
the miniskirt had entered the fray, requiring all available printing ink. But an audience of young women got Saint Laurent's message loud and clear. As the New York Times reported a few months later, the tuxedo made an instant hit with lots of dreamy-looking, long-haired girls who didn't have any tomboy tendencies. When in February 67, Yves Saint Laurent's spring-summer collection opened with several trouser suits, including the three-piece shark-striped suit that, topped up with a hat and tie, referred to El Capone, the message was, however, received with approval and astonishment by the press and the industry. It was quite a look, Gloria Emerson wrote the following day here in the New York Times. Not the beloved mini skirts of the media, but trousers suits had suddenly become the top talk of the town. In the years to come, as if an alarm clock had gone off, millions of women would decide to wear trousers suits. Saint Laurent had created a fashion moment, as we saw in the Bourse archive. <clears throat> it is unclear whether the steps that led Yves Saint Laurent to his success were part of a conscious strategy to ripen minds for a sea change in women's clothing. What is clear, however, is that Yves Saint Laurent's statement was not born out of any desire to make women equal to men in the workplace. Time and again, Yves Saint Laurent has denied any such intention. His trouser suits were an explicit attempt to make women's clothes that looked first and foremost, elegance with a sensual aura. A look that expressed a new female eroticism. Saint Laurent wanted women to move freely. He even gave them special handbags with shoulder straps to be totally at ease. This approach contrasted sharply with Dior's designs, which had dominated the female silhouette for a long time with broad hips, tight waistlines and full bosoms that stressed seduction and reproduction. The design of Yves Saint Laurent's trouser suits was not meant to give women equality, but freedom of movement, as we see here in a Ralph Lauren outfit 10 years later, with a very large mobile phone. <laughs> Saint Laurent was not the first to introduce trouser suits for women. Predecessors included the American Claire McCardle, Britain's Mary Quant, of course, the French Pierre Cardin, all of whom had shown trouser suits before. However, these earlier attempts to introduce trouser suits had included longer jackets in a tunic form, unlined and with trousers closing at the side, rather than in the front, while fabrics were chosen from lighter materials than in menswear. Saint Laurent's innovation was to introduce tailoring techniques that used to be confined to menswear to produce elegant trouser suits for women. His revolution included a technological transformation that would require, require new ways of production, new materials, new ways of sizing, new combinations of inner and outer fabrics, and new techniques for stiffening textiles. Interestingly, some of these inventions later returned in menswear, as in the soft suits, which Giorgio Armani, he is again, became famous for in the 80s. So what explains Yves Saint Laurent's success? The new business model that included ready-to-wear designer clothes or his entourage of daring women? All of this was already present. The technical, technological innovation then. It took Saint Laurent and the fashion industry several months, if not years, to fully implement the consequences of the road he was now heading. The cultural context. Earlier designs that, with hindsight, seemed to have prepared the revolution had barely got serious attention. Women's lip, what Saint Laurent intended to realize with introducing trouser suits, referred to a different kind of liberation than the one he happened to bring about. In February 67, in spite of all the spotlights that had lighted the catwalk, both Saint Laurent and the audience present seemed to have blindly started a revolution. Nevertheless, women in the business world, who a few years before would have risked contempt and even a fine for wearing trousers in the office, would soon benefit. In 67, a new thing was introduced on the catwalk, the trousers suit as a new beginning for women's fashion. That something new and interesting was presented was noticed, 
but it took some time for the world to discover what it had welcomed and to realize that the garment that had been worn before by singular women like Marlene Dietrich had become a legitimate piece of fashion, a public entity. In spite of all the attention that went into the rising of hands, it was the trouser suit that women started to wear for the first time, which caused a more silent revolution. It is the outcome of communication in what I would like to call the parliament of fashion, which involves many parties, as you have seen. Again, <clears throat> there is not a single entity responsible for starting a fashion trend. But sometimes there are individuals like Saint Laurent who drop the last grain of sand on a full scale to switch the image. It was also the last time. No one has ever managed to ignite a revolution in fashion on these global dimensions. There's one <clears throat> minor exception, Nuccia Prada, who studied political sciences and took part in the student revolutions of the 60s in Rome before she became CEO of the family company. But that was with bags, often big bags. But we do not do bags here. <laughs> Besides these bags, often big, signified another era, that of mobility, of a nomadic existence, often intercontinental. These bags contained a whole life. From the early 70s on, the sea change created by the revolution in suits liberated the public in a way. The question in fashion was not any longer if the hands were rising or falling, but how women integrated menswear in their wardrobes and vice versa. It signaled a treasure hunt in old cases and closets. More was found along the way in terms of color, embroidery and use of fabric. Anything seemed possible. An enormous mix and match took off and was shown where you show yourself, on the streets of big cities. From then on, new designers, members of the generation after Saint Laurent, did not even bother to become a couturier first. They immediately started as a designer. What they found on streets was translated in their designs, like here Martin Marjela did, a Belgian designer. This meant that the fashion industry needed to react swiftly to any change. This is one of the reasons why companies like Hennes and Maurits were and are so enormously successful, helped by the generous copyright laws in Sweden, with which IKEA also works so flexibly. These companies, and Primark is the latest chain store in this respect, although Irish, were an answer to the demand of the public to adapt to fashion styles that are created by themselves, with the help of designers who translate these styles into relatively cheap clothes, like Gautier did, for instance. And also the influence of these designers diminished importantly in the last decade. This is all due to the growth of social media and the shift of shopping to the web. What we have seen is that the parliament of fashion, which consists of an ever-growing mass of consumers, especially in Asia, has created a fashion environment in which the production and consumption is fired up by consumers themselves. They all seek their 15 minutes of fame on blogs, Vimeo or Instagram presenting themselves or, or, themselves or people they photograph on the streets in clothes that are supposed to be trendy. If you study these kinds of blogs, you will see that the crux of this trendiness lies in the combination of styles. The basis for these combinations is not, a, is not a fat wallet filled with pounds, euros or bitcoins, but creativity of the individual, as we have seen before in the 60s. The thesis that fashion is a big capitalist conspiracy to lure money out of the pockets of a youthful public holds no longer. Fashion influences all of us, that is, our closets, and the day-to-day -day decisions we make every morning standing before them. This happens in constant communication with others and is fueled by cheap clothes, and we have to deal with the serious problem that they are produced under horrible circumstances in faraway countries like Bangladesh and Kenya. A better option is to look in our own closets 
or that of your parents, to go to second-hand stores and, in growing numbers, to visit special web stores, advertising for sales with huge percentages of discount of fancy prices. What are all these people communicating? This is far more complex than the revolution Voltaire and others started with black and white. There are far more possibilities to play with signs and tokens at the moment. We have seen that there are three big issues involved in what we communicate while wearing clothes. Why our medium is the message, because everybody is a brand. We communicate freedom. We wear what we want any time. Like these people working in, a, in a, an advertisement company and uh, trying to look like mad man figures. Or this way, in the park. We communicate wealth. Where to express your cultural or financial value, like before. But now you do that by wearing a cheap Scandinavian brand, like the Duchess of Cambridge is did. Where to express your masculinity or femininity, here before and now in this way, wearing skirts. Everybody is a brand. Well, how do you do that? You say no to the bourgeois costume and you say yes to the quality of style of 2015 while wearing Paul Smith and G-Star. You say no to wealth displayed in a, in a way that uh, where Feblen has, has written about that is conspicuous consumption. And you say yes to design and good taste. Less is more, no labels. You say no to this explicit sexual uh, presentation, and you say yes to choice, to crossing borders with a skirt. But how does this communication take place? When Wolfson went public 50 years ago, the street was the place to be. Couturiers, who became the first designers, strolled around the inner city, taking notes and sometimes pictures of what people, and especially young people, were wearing. This information was blended in their designs for next season. What we see now is that the clothes influential people are wearing are immediately distributed through all kinds of media and copied within hours. The downside of this is that the basics of all these clothes need to be more or less the same to make instant varieties possible, as you see here in a photograph of G-Star. A well-known and rather early example of a brand who did this is Nike part, of Nike, part of the sneaker culture that grounded us since the 80s. This is the opposite of the T-Ford commercial. You can get them in any color as long as it's black. With Nike, you can get them in any combination of colors and patterns as long as it is printed in the same basic five or six designs. This is a business model that ensures the huge profits that are made by Nike. Fashion is related to the individual science system and is a language as such with which people are able to communicate. But you need to be au courant. You need to know who Kanye West is or the leading character of the bridge or the killing. Fashion is no art. It does not belong in museums, although it is often used by museum staff to enhance the annual figures. You will see that next month with the big McQueen exhibition that will open in London. In my opinion, fashion is too much related to individuals to be an art in itself. It's a form of form of art, though, but rather a most individual performing art. You would restrict its importance if you only focus on the design. Fashion is a science system that only works in a context where it was meant to work, in the public space, for everyone to see, in constant dialogue with everyone else around it. It is just there that we have seen the change in the last decade. Although you still see fashion at work while sitting on a bench and reflecting on existence, as you normally do behind a coffee or tea, you see a lot more while checking social media and news sites behind your desk, in the same way as you would do on that bench outside in the centre of Cambridge. But what do you see nowadays? Let me recap what I stated earlier. 
Fashion news is no longer the privilege of journalists of fashion houses. The leading informants are fashion bloggers, who attract a growing number of fashionistas, as they are called, who are simply curious. These bloggers do not have the authority of Susie Menkes of the International Herald Tribune, Tribune once had, but they are followed by the big brands and, not unimportant, by millions of potential buyers. That is another thing that has changed. Big designers are no longer big stars. Like supermodels, like Claudia Schiffer, who is now the face of the German car brand Opel. How low can you go? <clears throat> when Wilson was founded, Yves Saint Laurent was more than alive. He alone could change the fashion world as a couturier. In the 70s and 80s, we saw that the inevitable further step was taken. Designers emerged who didn't even have their own couture house. They immediately started to design for the ready-to-wear market. What has changed dramatically since then is that the choice has become more individual. It is the image that counts. Crisp and white in summer, dark and leathery in winter, and always an element of cool laid-back chic. Bon chic, bon genre, with a twist. Glitzy at Italy as a source for high fashion and chic, is replaced by the urban coolness of Scandinavia, more particular Denmark and Sweden, as we have seen in the image of the Duchess of Cambridge. Where do we find the role models who influence this laid-back fashion? Again, on the web, on Netflix, and thus screens worldwide. The influence of series like Borgen, The Killing, The Bridge, and Legacy is not only noticeable in the film industry, but also in many shops on the streets. What disappeared is the direct relation between street fashion and designer wear. The fashion blogger functions as an intermediate between fashion and consumer. That is why the influence of designers, fashion journalism, and glosses declined with the same speed as cheap ready-to-wear chains popped up and department stores encountered so many troubles. Fashion is influenced by ladies and men like these, who are obviously not interested in fashion, but have become role models despite themselves. And these are the bloggers, like Nikki from Ireland, who inform you about this news nowadays, or from Manila or from Krakow there on the right. The very personal way of branding yourself is further communicated in a more intense way by the inked in community, a trend set by an all too familiar guy for you, I think, and followed by the masses. If you yourself do not wear tattoos, I'm pretty sure your sons and daughters do. People made a screen of their own skins. The plain clothes that hide these skins are only a cover-up. The growth of individual power is enormous, and we can see it is represented in fashion. The cyborg, a term coined by Donna Haraway, is the role model of today. A man or woman alone, surrounded by numerous networks and friends, all immediately present in all the devices he or she is keeping in some kind of bag. Fashion was ready for this move for quite some years. There he or she is living in his own, his or her own world, his own bubble, trying not to be bothered by others unless they are admit, admitted in the inner circle, not bothered either by physical or other imperfections of partners and children. It's a clean world, filled with nice emoticons and witty, snappy sentences of only 140 tokens, long uttered by people who are always happy. The fashionable clothes these people are wearing are one big pile of emotions. And yes, the fashion world was ready for this move to super-individualism. It came with a downside too. The lone wolves that threaten our society from within. Did fashion predict this, like the economic growth of the 60s was predicted by the miniskirt? You can always be right in hindsight. Nothing is more difficult than predicting the future 
as the Chinese say. The fashion world should be humble about that, and humbling it was the other day when I came across an old copy of British Folk. I was preparing for this lecture and looked at the cover. They wish, wish us a glorious autumn. As always, you do not see a date on the cover. Fashion is always about now and tomorrow. Dates will make your work immediately outdated the day after. But I found it eventually at the back, this date. It read September 2008. Remember Lehman Brothers credit crunch, the year all our savings vanished? But this is what the fashionistas of Vogue had in mind for us, a glorious autumn. In all modesty, coming from the fashion world, this is also my wish for Wilson. Thank you for having me here.